Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to today's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Deborah J. Saunders, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's program. I'm a fellow with the Discovery Institute's Chapman Center for Citizen Leadership, and I'm a syndicated columnist. You may have seen me previously on the club's week to week program, which focuses on top news and current events. Thus, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss John McWhorter's new book, Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. It came out last week and it is already making waves and inspiring debates for its insightful critiques of critical race theory and anti-racism. John's now a regular columnist for the New York Times and the author of several books on linguistics and he's an associate professor at Columbia University. John, welcome to the Commonwealth Club for today's discussion on your new book. But one quick note before we jump in, if you have any questions for John or me, please put them on the YouTube chat feature and they'll be forwarded to me, forwarded to me during the program. So John, let's begin. Um, I loved the book. It never got boring. And it made me think about the world in a new way. So before I drill down, tell us, why did you write the book? What's it about? And what do people who really, really don't like your viewpoint say about it? And, and how do you respond? The book is written not as some sweater-vested, starchy kind of person who is writing a book that's designed to get money from white conservatives. That's what a lot of people think about Black quote-unquote conservative thinkers, although what I am is a liberal who just gets on people's nerves. But it's not that. This is not a right-wing Black book, especially because I'm not of the right wing. What it's for is really mostly people left of center who are listening to these voices from the radical hard left and beginning to get a feeling that somehow those people's view must be actual truth rather than one facet of the left out of fear because there's a certain kind of person who now basically tells you that you're a racist, i.e. what we now think of as a moral pervert, if you disagree with what is actually a very narrow, underthought and punitive range of views. I think that what we need is left of center, but constructive and unself-concerned positions on what Black people need in this country. And so I think that what most people are going to say about it, and I've been being you know, beaten up on by that kind of person for my views on race now since late in the Clinton administration. So it's old, old news. <laughs> and it's interesting because you're only as good as what you did last week. And there are people these days who I can tell, I completely understand it. I think a lot of people think I first started writing for the Daily Beast in about 2015, and that right now I'm making my way, that I'm climbing up and getting a little bit of attention. They think that I'm new at this, and so I think that's part of why they throw this at me so hard. But the main thing is that they say that I am just writing this book because they're the sorts of things that white people want to hear. And that's really not true. The book is written for Black people as much as for white people. I think most Black people, especially once you step about two feet beyond the intelligentsia and the media, agree with the sorts of things I'm saying. And this, this is the hard thing. To the extent that a certain kind of enlightened, sensitive white person wants to hear what I've written in Woke Racism, they should. There's a facile idea that what white people want to hear must automatically be racist and letting white people off the hook. That's facile, that's simplistic. It could be, the probability does allow that what a white person enjoys hearing is also the moral truth. And I'm taking a gamble that my book falls into that realm. So that's what Woke Racism is. Um, your book, it starts out with the story of a food writer, Alison Roman, for oh. the New York Times. She criticized Marie Kondo, and she criticized Chrissy Teigen for cashing in on commercialism. And, and she was professionally destroyed for it uh, because Kondo is Japanese and Teigen's half white. And people were saying she was a racist and she was punching down. You really don't like that phrase, punching down. Uh, she's, she was suspended. She eventually left the New York Times. And you don't think she would have been targeted five years ago and professionally destroyed the way she was now. Can you talk about how things change so quickly? And uh, if, if you see, well, and then I'll do a follow-up when, when you're done. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up her because I opened the book with her and that really was what sparked me to write the book. It was something that sounds that trivial. I like her, I like, I like the food that she was teaching me to make during the pandemic. Now all of a sudden she was gone and I noticed it and then I read why. 
And that was when something clicked in me and I thought this is absolutely absurd. And I could tell it was gonna continue and it most certainly did. I thought this is the new mood. There is a newly influential group of people who are gonna keep doing this and I can't have it. So it wasn't me rubbing my hands together and thinking, ha 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 ha, I'm gonna write a book that white people wanna read about racism. It was, where is my food columnist? That was what it really was. And what that was, was that she was essentially fired for not trying to oh, not trying to battle power differentials. There's an analysis there. The idea is that Chrissy Teigen is half Thai and therefore not completely white. Marie Kondo is a Japanese citizen, and you know that's many things. It's not a white American person or a white European person, and therefore to criticize them if you're white is some sort of moral transgression. And all of us know, except for uh, the roughly seven and a half people who were probably responsible for getting her fired, that it makes no sense for her to lose her job for these offhanded criticisms of these two very rich, very influential people, neither of whom think of themselves as at the hands of white hegemony. Both of them were perplexed at all of this. And yet that's the way it had to be. And I thought, wow. And this is the main thing about what I thought. I thought the people who got Alice and Roman fired thought they were doing a good thing. I wasn't thinking that they're holding pitchforks and running down a hill. I thought these are peaceable, sensible, probably overeducated people who genuinely thought that what they did was the right thing. But the thing is, most of the rest of us know that what they did was a barbarity. And I thought, what is the gap in understanding here? And I thought, it's this issue of power being everything. And I took it from there. Did she make a mistake apologizing before she was suspended? Would, if, she had, if she had fought back sooner, would that have helped? You know, she couldn't have known because the history has been going by so quickly. In her time, you know, which was 15 minutes ago, it was reasonable for her to think that she could apologize and be let alone. But it absolutely didn't work. It only made it worse. And we've all seen things like that, but all of that took a real, real jump starting in the spring of 2020. So in retrospect, no, she should have said, I haven't done anything wrong. You can say whatever you want to about me and I will suffer the consequences, but I will admit no culpability. But I understand why in the spring of 2020, she didn't know that it had gotten so bad that people like this needed to be standed down en masse across the country. She couldn't have known. Now I'll bet she would have, or if <laughs> for some reason she asked me, I would tell her don't apologize. And uh, by the way, thank you for pronouncing hegemony because I, right, you said in the book, a lot of people don't know how to pronounce it. And I'm like, do I or don't I? Now I know. <laughs> I appreciate that. You're a linguist. And uh, I was I very like insecure. Saying that word. I was very, in, it made me very insecure. So <laughs> are you seeing, uh, are, do you think things are going to get worse or are they going to get better? Are, are there signs that this is ending or uh, that people are suddenly realizing that you're right, that these people are, that nice people are actually going out and hounding people, uh, trying to take away their jobs for trivial uh, faults? It, what's, what's the answer to that? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's changing. And six months ago, I wasn't sure. But at this point, I'm seeing various signs that there's going to be a pushback against this, partly as we come out of the pandemic, partly as we see so much of it happening that we realize that it's quote unquote, a thing. Noticing how for better or for worse, the word woke is now a slur. That happened because this kind of person has has annoyed and 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 bemused so very many, I hate to say normal thinking people. Yeah, um, this is one of my books that I can tell. Um, I shouldn't say this, so I would like people to read it. I can tell that this book is going to be topical. This is going to be one which in 10 years is going to be seen as part of a certain moment, and it was part of a pushback against something, and I hope helped to serve a purpose. I do see it changing, and I wanted to do everything that I could to make sure that as many people as possible understood that to resist this particular extreme is not racist, no matter what the elect, as I call them, say, and no matter whether that elect person is Black. It's not racist. Other things are. So I hope this book will be a part of that. Well, and by the way, you, you quote Jody Bottom, and you take the phrase the elect from Jody Bottom, uh, but he was talking about religious people, and you're talking about people whose politics have become a religion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to tell you, uh, you've totally radicalized me. 
because I, I spent 24 years as a conservative columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. And I was really tender about how I dealt with people. But you're saying, and one of the things I really got out of your book is you're telling people don't apologize for your viewpoints, ditch the anguish, don't back down. When people start challenging you in a certain way, don't try to be nice about it, give it back to them. I was on Twitter like yesterday and I was thinking about what we were gonna talk about and I just jumped on someone's throat. <laughs> You've made me sort of feel that when, <laughs> when people when people start trying to challenge you and make you feel like maybe they're going to say you're a racist, that you've just got to slam them back. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a belligerent person, but I think that when it comes to this type, we need to simply stand up in the same way that they're standing up and look them in the eye and say no. And I use the analogy of bopping a shark on the nose. And I don't want people to think that I mean you're supposed to be physical with anybody. But with this elect kind of person, and not just anybody who's arguing from the left, but this type who is poised to call you a moral pervert in the public square if you don't agree with their views, you just have to say, no, I am not a racist. I don't agree with what you're saying. And you can say whatever you want about me, wherever you will. I am not changing my mind. If we say that enough, to the extent that we can within the parameters of our lives to this kind of person, then this will change. But it does mean that a lot of people, and unfortunately here we're talking about mainly white people have a responsibility, which is that not only do you have to know that racism is more than burning crosses on people's lawns, that was not the most natural way of thinking for white people. And I think most white people got that message. But now the idea has to be, get used to being called a racist and so social media, realize that the world will keep spinning, your life in most cases will keep going. But in the meantime, you can't give these people what they want, because if you give it to them, they'll take it. And if you really want a world run by people who have taken what is supposed to be a kind of compassion into a social justice religion, it's not about fairness, but about virtue signaling. If you don't want that world, these people have to be told to sit back down, not to leave the room, but just to sit back down. And what I really hope is that people have that backbone and they must understand this. I am not telling white people to tell black people to sit down. My main mental image is it's a white person who you're telling to sit down. Although there are certainly black people like this, although it's not the way most black people think. That's something I wish more people would keep in mind. Yeah, you, you, you make that really clear in the book. I mean, one of the things that you write about is you say that uh, basically the elect uh, they, they, tr they, they, they seem to, they, they think as if black people are hothouse flowers who will be, who will wilt under certain kinds of uh, criticism. And so that every, anything that you see that might be dysfunctional behavior among certain individuals is something that you have to uh, couch in incredibly sensitive ways. Uh, and, and what you say is what basically you've seen people do is lower their standards in order to seem nicer and, and, and not racist. Can you talk about that for a minute, please? Yeah, I reject the idea that to be a black person is to walk around in a constant existential kind of pain because of things that happened hundreds of years ago or things that happened 50 years ago or even a terrible murder of a black man two years ago. There's this idea that every black individual walks around carrying the entire history of the race upon them. And that therefore you have to be very sensitive when you talk about race issues around us and that you have to basically come as close as you can to giving in to any demand that any of us make. And it follows naturally from that, that you give black people a pass. You cannot expect serious competition to be engaged in by such a person who's so burdened, a little, but essentially what would be a consolation prize to other people is supposed to be the top prize for us. I reject that. And I don't reject that as somebody who is uniquely rock ribbed. I don't reject that because I didn't grow up poor. I reject that because I think it's a natural way of thinking, which black people in the past generally had. There was no push from the intelligentsia and the media to adopt, yes, I can't, as a mantra. And just last week, Condoleezza Rice was on The View expressing exactly the views that I'm expressing. And she grew up in the segregated South. There's nothing unique about where she came from in that way. She titled her autobiography, Extraordinary Ordinary People, who told her this 
And this is, she grew up in Birmingham, of all places. And I don't mean in England. I mean in Alabama, where hideous things were happening to Black people in the street. She knew the four little girls who were killed in the church there. And yet she knew that, yes, we can't is not progress. That was an idea that settled in in the late 60s in certain circles. And that notion was really magnified and sent out to mainstream America in the wake of George Floyd's murder in particular. I reject it and I reject it thinking of myself as utterly ordinary in that. I want people to, you know, I want people to put on the patch, the mental patch of thinking when somebody says they're gonna call me a racist on Twitter, look them in the eye and call them a racist back. That's, that, that's weird. I'm using that word patch because people use it in linguistics and I shouldn't, but I want people to get rid of that little weird blip in thinking that they've been taught that black people are weak that black people can't be subject to real standards because of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining. I don't think our ancestors wanted us to think of it that way. So one of the reasons your book, Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America, uh, one of your points is that when you have so many people uh, in the elect, and we'll get in, into what the elect is in a second, thinking that the important thing is what how they feel about other people and think about other people, not looking for practical things, solutions about disparity, that that deserves, that that's a disservice to everybody in this country. Um, and and uh, can, you, can you talk to that for a second, please? Sure. It's really very simple. A lot of the people that we're talking about are under the impression that mm -hmm. showing that you understand that societal racism exists is really key. They think that Showing that you understand that is a necessary prelude to changing the world. And the problem is, says who? In, in, in what sense? Where, where'd you get that? Nobody would have had any idea what that meant 60 years ago in the civil rights movement. So what's the proof now? And I imagine some very sophisticated political science or sociology professors have answers in you know, maybe some academic journals that nobody's ever read or, or some books that I haven't gotten to, but the point hasn't been made in any mainstream way that we can say that all of those people who are pretending this know. It's just that it feels right. Frankly, it's easy. So you stand up and show that you know something and everybody does high fives, but what have you done for somebody who's suffering? No one really asked that question, except someone like Robin DiAngelo in literally the worst book ever written. It's the worst book I've ever read. And if there's one thing that I have done a lot of, it's read books. Worst book ever written. She actually says, she actually anticipates this question, that if you're asking, okay, but what are you actually going to go do? It's called solutionism. You're going too fast. You're letting yourself off the hook because what you're really supposed to think about is how you're complicit in a racist system. But someone like me standing on the outside asks, why? How is this better than what happened before? And the thing is, if somebody can give an answer, you can't give the answer with the attitude of, well, of course it's because no one has said what it was. We're having a whole national discussion where nobody explains that, despite the fact that it's a painfully obvious question. So my book in part is designed to ask it and to show that frankly, there is no answer. So I wanna get to questions from uh, viewers, but I have a, just one area I wanna go over with you first. You said the, the most uh, effective way to help uh, black, uh, black people, poor black people in America is to do three things, end the war on drugs, teach phonics, and offer more vocational training. You don't mention family. So. Uh, <laughs> no. So I, I, I was surprised, <laughs> but obvi and, and obviously you yeah. think it's really obvious. So explain to me. Up very, I'm sorry if I seem no, glib fine. there, but no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I, um, I know many people who, <laughs> <good>. <laughs> I know many people who um, have written very compelling pieces about family values and the value of there being two parents in the home. Um, I certainly know what the expansion of welfare in the late 60s did to black communities. It's a little told story. I've now and then said, I wish somebody would make a movie about that because it would get it into the consciousness of what that did. But in general, my feeling is to write about the family, to write, this is what people should do. More people should get married. More men should stay in relationships that they maybe don't want to be in. I don't see 
how effective that would be. That's all. It's not that I don't agree. There's the wonderful statistic that, you know, if you graduate from high school and you get a job and, you know, you don't have a child until you're married or at least, you know, permanently involved, you will not be poor. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. But in terms of saying to people out in the world that, it seems to me that people have been saying that, that you can date it to roughly, you could date it to the Moynihan report, but there have been things being written since about the mid 80s. And what I'm interested in is results. And it doesn't seem to work. You can't tell people to have different family values. It seems to me that those values will fall out of other policy decisions that will shape the world around people. That's my feeling. And that's why there was nothing about, I'll bet single parenthood is not in the book. I never wrote, I didn't write that. And that's I, I why. I think you had one teensy, teensy mention because I was listening for, looking for it. But you know, one of the things, I mean, ending the war on drugs, that's a great idea too. But how realistic is that? I mean, there have been people who've been writing about that for a long time. Hey, it's even hard to get schools to use, to teach phonics. I mean, <laughs> that's not even easy. And more vocational training, same thing. I mean, the last two things, they're less controversial, but it's hard to get them through. Ending the war on drugs, I just don't, um, and I know that I know that you want to get in the in complete war on drugs, which just doesn't seem all that realistic either. Or am I wrong? Is there some place that's starting to do that? Really legitimate questions. And I include them because over the past 20 years and 20 is not 50. I haven't been around that long. But over the past 20 years, I've seen cracks in the plaster on mm -hmm. those things. And so the fact that you know, to, to be graphic nowadays, you can walk down New York streets and smell marijuana right up your nose and there's somebody just standing right there. To be honest, I think that that's fine. You know, if you can drink bourbon, why should you not be able to, you know, marijuana? That's the beginning. And I know an awful lot of people who have agitated for it to go further, including, I don't have time these days because I'm a dad, even some branches of the NAACP were opening up to that idea, despite the fact that in most of those cases, you're dealing with conservative ministers where that's not where they live, but they were beginning to open up to it. So I thought it's not impossible. But Deborah, you're right. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's a tough one. With vocational education, mm -hmm. we're seeing some interest in that sort of thing going back to the Obama administration. I think that could be made to float. Phonics is a whole other story. But yeah, I, I take your point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, fr from viewers, uh, first question. Critical race theory uh, seems to exploit the power of words to tongue tie everyone, including me. Um, how do you counteract such deliberate attempts to redefine common words? You know, you can't counteract people's reformation of words. It's inevitable in language change. It's almost never deliberate. But unfortunately, with critical race theory, our discussion is polluted by the fact that there are certain legal papers written decades ago that you know nobody but a legal scholar could love. And then there's that way of thinking having percolated into graduate schools in the humanities and social sciences and also education schools, such that philosophies based on those ideas are now being promulgated and foisted upon eight and nine-year-olds. And so someone says, what is critical race theory doing in our classrooms? And the smart response is supposedly to say, who's teaching these obscure legal scholars in class? When that's obviously not what anybody <laughs> means. I think that at this point, it's maybe handy that what's happening in the classes might be called CRT, and that we all know what that's an abbreviation for. But that little, I've written a few columns trying to cut through that mess. I've done a podcast about it, but a podcast episode about it, my Lexicon Valley, which I'm not trying to push, but I've never written out a full column about only that. But I did do a Lexicon Valley about what CRT means. You can't help that. But what dismays me the most, actually on this day that we're doing this, I'm realizing this is a thing is that a lot of people left of center really don't think that there's anything going on in classrooms. They think that we should be talking about January 6th, and, and we should, but that there's, there's no problem with anything going on in our schools, whatever you call it, and that people like me are just making that up based on having read maybe one story about one school. I think there is an us who know that that's not true, and I'm thinking we need to we need to craft that message better because a lot of really smart, well-intentioned people think that we're just making things up because that's what a certain kind of person tells them and they understandably listen to them. So there's a messaging issue, but language will always change. Terms will always be messy. We just have to analyze what the mess is, which is where my work is beginning to intersect 
But my work is beginning to straddle linguistics and race more than it ever has, because I'm beginning to have to use both halves of my brain lately. Because yeah, the way we talk about these things often is because of how annoying the change of meaning in words can be, because it can happen so quickly. So today I'm, I am in Virginia as we speak, and it is election day. Nothing Democrat, going on down there. Yeah. Derek, <laughs> D- Democrat T- Terry McAuliffe says that they don't teach CRT in public schools. Uh, He's wrong. <laughs> and, you know, and if he means they don't teach the, the works of Richard Delgado and Kimberly Crenshaw, he's right. But if he means that all the parents and friends who write me saying, guess what sorts of things my child's history teacher is teaching. And I wrote the principal and the principal wrote me back something in Hebrew that doesn't make any sense and won't listen. That's happening across the country. It doesn't have to be critical race theory itself. But if your kids are being taught that whiteness is a kind of inherent guilt, if your kids are being taught that blackness is a kind of eternal victimhood, if your kids are being taught that all subjects need to be looked at through the lens of what they signal for power relations, especially between white and brown people, if that's what your kids are being taught to any appreciable extent, such that they would come home and say, I'm not enjoying this, mom, that's critical race theory. Mm-hmm. And anybody who denies that that's an issue either doesn't know, and you know, some people find education policy boring, you know. I don't care about football. I don't know anything about it. There are many people who live for football. I get it. Maybe you don't care about education. Or you're being willfully naive because you're trying to placate a certain base and get elected. And I would completely understand that too. But that means that we can't listen to that fight between those two for a reflection of what's actually happening. Either way, yes, there is something really scary going on in education today. So I have another question. Uh, John, what do you think of the 1619 project? Um, (laughs) The truth about it is that a lot of it is just a history lesson. And it's a history lesson that, you know, cocks our ear more to power differentials than we might be used to, but there's nothing wrong with it. What got it a Pulitzer was the claim that the Revolutionary War was fought to a significant degree because of people not wanting to let go of slavery. The idea being that to to lose the war would mean that you could not have plantations. It would seem to me that that claim has been disproven. And that's what I think of the 1619 project, any discussion of it that purports that a central and highly celebrated tenet of it was not disproven is a discussion that I have a hard time participating in. I'll put it, I'll put it that way. There are a lot of things you have that, that you just have lost patience for. These prevalent beliefs that just go against what you have what you understand as an academic. Um, and let me you teach at Columbia. Uh, what are your students like these days? Do you think they're prepared? Uh, you've been teaching for a while. Are they better prepared now? Are they um, are they are they up to the challenges? Are, it, how, how, how prepared do you think they are for university education? You know, Deborah, I don't know the answer to that question yet because um, of mundane things, which is that everything went crazy in the spring of 2020, but by then universities were online and that puts a real filter between you and students. I don't, I don't get to talk to them offline much. And so I just have taught them in classes. And now we're just now back on campus. And, you know, honestly, with everybody in masks, which they are at Columbia, it muffles communication and experience once again. And and I hate to say this, it's not that I'm an anti-masker or an anti-vaxxer or anything, but having to always have that thing on my face means that I avoid being on campus because I wanna breathe and smell the world. So I'm not really back on campus yet, except to sit in rooms with cloth on my face and it's not the same. So I don't know. That's a question I'll have more of a sense of in the spring when I'll be spending more time on campus and some things will be able to happen outside. And so you're not always talking through this curtain. And I know that sounds trivial, but it really does affect how how you smell a campus, how you get a sense of what's going on. Now, if you had asked me before the pandemic, I would have said that my next the, the idea that the campus is being taken over by tenured radicals, I've always thought that was vastly exaggerated until roughly June 
of 2020 when suddenly all of that hysteria from 1997 came true, which is why I started getting up on a, a soapbox. So that's my real view. I used to say, my students don't act like that. I said that for years and years. And Columbia has been almost oddly immune to the sorts of scenes that you've seen at Yale, for example. That, that simply hasn't happened around me. I don't know those kids. Has something happened since then? I'm inclined not to think so, but I just can't say anything yet because I can't report from the ground. You know, one of the things I'm thinking as I'm reading this book is, uh, one of the messages is they can go after anyone for, for the most in, inconsequential thing. Uh, do you have a plan? I mean, it's, I'm guessing that no one, do you have a plan? If, if obviously you're still there, you're still at the New York Times, you're still at Columbia, you're still doing things. Have you, has anyone ever gone after you and how did you deal with it? Or if, if it hasn't happened, how, what, how will you? Um, that's a good question. I should say that that has not happened at Columbia yet. I have mm -hmm. gotten no signals of that kind from any of the higher ups. However, I would be an idiot not to wonder whether it could happen because you never know. And all it would take is one person who decides to interpret one thing that I write or say, and it would snowball. And I, I have no reason to think that if it snowballed beyond a certain point that I could not be, be let go. Yes, yeah, so that, that could happen. And so I've spent a lot of time since the middle of 2020, because I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to back down. I had spent a lot of time setting things up so that I would continue to be able to pay my mortgage and continue to be able to make a living. And I've done that. That job is complete. And so I'm not that worried. My sense is, watch this come and you know, bite me on the quote unquote elbow in a couple of years. My sense is that I'm not going to lose my job. For one thing, the pendulum is shifting. And there's mm -hmm. some other factors. It would be a pretty bad look to fire me for those things. Mm -hmm. But if it does happen, I will land on my feet and I will continue to say things. So that's the idea. I realize I cannot let that possibility keep me from having my say because I think that that, said, that say needs to be had. And I hope that some other black professors will follow me. And from what I'm seeing, that's gonna happen. And so, yeah, that's, that's how that is. You know, another thing, Deborah, is that, um, I get the feeling that if they were thinking of doing that, I'm 56. One pragmatic discussion might be, well, how long is he going to hang in anyway? I'm not sure they know that I, I'm going to keep doing this into my 80s if I can. But they might think, well, just let him do it for another seven or eight years. So yes, I've thought about it, but I have not seen any portent of it yet. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, Jody Bottom is a friend of mine, and you ah. mentioned him in your book. So please talk about the elect for a second and why and why you decided to use that term in your book as well, since Jody. Yeah, um, thank you to Jody, because the, Jody, it's the title. You know, the titles of my books are never the ones that I originally had. And all of my materials for the book, Woke Racism, on my laptop now, the label, the book is called The Elect, and there's a part of me that will always call it that. <laughs> the Elect is um, my name for these people where it isn't that they're speaking, why is my voice cracking like I'm Henry Aldrich? It isn't that they are seeking power. It isn't that they're mean. It isn't that they're children. It's important to realize The Elect is not about college campuses. The elect can be in their 70s. These are people who feel that they have a good news with a capital G and a capital N that the world needs to listen to and that this is news that is so incontestably good that it's worth hurting people in order to make things so that the world works according to these tenets. But the way they conduct themselves and their utter imperviousness to any kind of logic or, or reason is reminiscent of people who think of themselves as chosen. And these are people who do think of themselves as having a precious higher wisdom that they feel is so precious that they will impose it upon the world via whatever means necessary. And you make the point of saying the, the worst thing about this phenomenon is they're not mean people. These are people who mm -hmm. think they're nice, good people and that they're doing the right thing when they go after somebody like that. Um, one of the things that you that you mentioned earlier, and it's also in the book, the elect scare you more than January 6th. Could you talk about that for a second, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to ask about institutions. What institutions are people like that penetrating? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And the snappy answer these days is that those people are overturning voting laws and that they're they're trying to get black people not to vote. And I understand where that's coming from, but I can't help noticing that on the ground, once you get past the symbolism, it is revolting that somebody tries to suppress the black vote in order to keep Democrats from having too high a tally. It's revolting on many levels, but it doesn't work as well as we're often told. That's the thing that I think the left doesn't want to admit. It's a terrible gesture from the right, but it doesn't actually work that well. And in the meantime, what I see happening with the elect is that they're taking over academia, the media, the mm -hmm. arts, and the law. They're taking over all four of those things. And there's a certain kind of person that will tell me that those things aren't as important as people trying to keep Black people from voting and failing. Well, you know what? That makes no sense to me. And I think that makes no sense to a lot of people to ask why it's a big deal that a certain group of people are deeply affecting the way we teach, learn, question, judge, and think, and paint, and make music. That's what these people are doing. To say that's no big deal is frankly Philistine. And I don't think most people who ask that question really believe that it's a, it's a valid point. This is huge. These people are taking over institutions, and we have to stop them, or we don't live in what we lived in before. And notice I'm not about to say something about America. Mm -hmm. I'm not that corny. This is not about some sort of jingoism. Just what we had. Most of us aren't running around thinking about ourselves as Americans. Mm -hmm. Just what we had as modern, enlightened people. I will not watch that turned over by people who think that treating me like a child and then get, doing high fives over the fact that you did it and it shows that you know racism exists because George Floyd died unjustly. No, that is not the way social history is supposed to proceed. I won't allow it. And that's why I wrote Woke Racism. So you talk about January 6th as being an effort to suppress the Black vote. That, I mean, I thought that was people who thought wrongly that Trump had won and that's why they went to the Capitol. Are, are, are you sort of conflating what happened then with what's happened afterward or am I um, missing something? No, no, I'm, I'm trying to give the people who say this the, the benefit of the doubt. The idea is that the people who think that Trump really should have won the election, where they think that Trump won the election and that therefore procedures needed to be overturned in order to make it look that way, okay. are the same people who are interested in overturning basic voting procedure and making sure that black people don't vote much. Kind of a stretch, but the idea being people who want to interfere with the electoral mechanisms in order to have things their own way. And then there's a kind of a sloppy conflation of one aspect of the right wing with another. That doesn't really work either, but I'm trying to address what these people throw out because that is a common view at this point. So a, a question from a viewer, why do you find the argument that music theory is racist so ridiculous? <laughs> because it was based on a very thin premise. A truly brilliant person looked at Mr. Schenker, Heinrich Schenker's work, and mm -hmm. found that, I mean, this is really the, the basis of it. Mm -hmm. First of all, that all of the people who get the most praise are white, but I think there are, one, reasons for that, and two, it was a very long time ago, and, and we live now, but two, the music theory in very obscure ways has to do with certain elements being foregrounded and certain elements being backgrounded or more specifically, elements that are in the background where if you do certain things, you can make them sound like they're in the foreground. That mm -hmm. whole issue of hierarchy, this music theorist claims, is parallel to views about hierarchy, and I'm going to say that word again, hegemony, and racism. Thank you. I swear to you, that's mm -hmm. the thesis. I tried. Mm -hmm. I read this work. That's mm -hmm. the thesis. And the mm -hmm. problem is not that somebody wrote something that under ordinary conditions, nobody would pay any attention to that. It's that music departments across the country are inviting that person to speak and share his views and are discussing his views. And I know in certain cases, letting those views affect their curriculum. That's the problem. And make, make sure, I'm not sure who, who will be looking at this. I don't think that the person in question is making any particular money. It's, this has nothing to do with me being jealous of career success or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's influence 
of that person based on such a thin premise. It's a perfect absurdity. And yet that's being treated as something significant. Not only is it condescending to black brilliance, but it's a waste of time in thinking about good music of any kind. Okay, uh, another uh, viewer. Uh, does the ongoing discussion on race submerge class considerations which are central to many problems? Socioeconomics should be held much more front and center in today's problems. And yet, this is the thing, as if there's only one thing. It used to be that people of a certain type, you could call them proto elects would complain about the racialization of poverty. When you talk about poverty, why is it always a black woman sitting on the steps with her kids? That was considered the greatest injustice in the 80s and the 90s. Well, now we don't talk about poverty that way anymore. And the whole discussion of there being a black underclass that doesn't bring in that there's a white underclass who are just as stuck, you know, the whole meth addiction, et cetera, J.D. Vance, all of that is very real and it's very talked about. It's about class these days. But now that's wrong. You can't talk about class because you're ignoring that a meth addicted person with only half of their teeth who can't take care of their kids and will never make a real living again and is living in a shack somewhere in a distant place and has no prospects for the future has mm -hmm. white privilege. That's today's discussion. And that's become especially, especially important for many people since about June 2020. That's not a human discussion. That is an exercise. Mm -hmm. that, that's kabuki. And it's obvious that a more rational America at this point would be moving towards thinking there are black people who need help, there are white people who need the same help. Being black now and middle class is normal and even default. You have to admit, you have to polish the crown where you've earned one. But no, we're not allowed because we're supposed to think of blackness and racism as the eternal root that rends our nation. I sincerely believe that that view today is more performance than pragmatic reality. And you know, if it makes me a white supremacist to call that out, I guess I am one. But I think then we need to redefine what we mean by white supremacy. Because frankly, the poor white person who I just described is not supreme. There's nothing supreme about that. And to master the mental exercise of supposing that somebody like that is privileged just because they're not brown mm -hmm. is an absurdity. It's a waste of time. We're only alive for about 80 years and we have things to do. It's time to stop those mind games and get down to really real social justice, which, and you know, for many people, this is a horrible thing to think. Social justice should apply to some white people too. It's always been like that in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question about uh, perceptions. So Pew Research does these polls where they ask people about racism globally. And they looked at, they, they talked to people from countries and people in Singapore, Spain, Japan, Italy, France, the UK, they all thought the United States was more racist in their own countries. Uh, Pew's also found that uh, uh, more black college students experience racism, say they do, than, than high school students. And um, younger people are more likely to see discrimination than older people. Uh, can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Do you mean that older people are more likely to see it than younger? No, they're less likely to say they see it than younger people. I mean, old, older, okay, yeah. Okay. I think that it's obvious that there's an extent to which education, part mm -hmm. of a modern education is that you're educated into understanding the nature of oppression, which is important, but that it can also teach a black person that they are suffering more than, for example, their ancestors, and by ancestors, I mean, say grandparents, ancestors mm -hmm. they know, mm -hmm. would say that they were. And so I'm particularly interested in that a college student is more likely to say they experience racism than a 14 or a 15 year old. And you think to yourself, are you really experiencing more because you're 20? Many people would say that you would experience it more when you were 14, when people were less trained to be polite. And so it shows you that there is a slip between, and this is hard, there's a slip between what people will attest and what the reality is. And it's not that somebody's doing that for malevolent reasons, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. there's a certain coaching that I think a lot of black people undergo, not consciously, but mm -hmm. we have to watch out for that. And for a white person to call that out takes a certain amount of bravery. And I know that most white people wouldn't be up for it. And I understand why, but mm -hmm. that reality is there. And as, as for other people in other countries, all I can say is that if what they mean is that they saw the footage of George Floyd being killed 
I'm sorry, but that's not a metric of whether this country is more racist than their country. We'd have to look at more than that. And I'm sorry, but honestly, that is what many foreigners are led to think. They're shown videos of certain truly disgusting incidents with the police, and they mm -hmm. assume that that is something that happens all over the country all the time, only to Black people, when actually those mm -hmm. things happen more to white people. That's a whole other thing. Or it used to be that the same kind of European or Japanese person would be shown film of Black ghettos, and they mm -hmm. would think, well, the only reason for that must be that Black people are not liked and therefore America is a more racist country than, and you know, in many cases, the country in question has a kind of racism that's endemic and more naked than anything that ever happens here. So we have to be careful about that. These days, the measure of America's racism is thought to be what happened to one man in the spring of 2020 captured on tragically clear video. Okay, I, I'm glad the world is seeing that, but you can't base junior sociology on that one thing. Japan mm -hmm. is less racist than the United States. I beg to differ, frankly, yeah. but the George Floyd video is hideous. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I understand that. I mean, in, in America becomes more multiracial every year. There, there are more children uh, born into not, not just white families or black families, multiracial families, Asians, Latinos. How, how is that affecting how people are looking at these issues of, of wokeness? Well, you know, if you think about the general trajectory of things, we're at a point where I would say that that's based on the schematic fiction that there are white people and black people and some Latinos scattered in there. And what are we going to do about these Asians? And some people seem to be from India. That's the discussion. Mm -hmm. That's not going to make any sense after about another generation. You can just look at little people now. And if you ask whether I'm thinking about my own kids whose mother is white, the answer is yes. It's going to get to the point where there are so many people of age who are mutts, where the whole issue of them having to own that they're black because they're one quarter black, or sometimes even half, or you know, the mother is Thai and the father is from Bosnia, what is the child? And the child is just nothing. And I think that that kind of person frustrates the people who like to talk about white versus black because they want to keep it down to these certain categories. They want to for reasons that make sense to them, they want to foster this constant guilt. Mm -hmm. The truth is, when I discuss the sorts of issues that I discuss, I think to myself, I'm putting an awful lot of energy into a discussion that's going to just look like something some people a long time ago were arguing too much about in 50 years, but I can't help being part of my own time. And, you know, no, is racism going to go away? It's probably not. Will there be some other form of discrimination that comes into play. I suspect classism will become sharper in yes. that future world, but we're becoming mutts more and more. It depends on the neighborhood, but there are plenty of mutts in even, for example, distant, poor white communities. There are a lot of interracial marriages in that world now, although we don't talk about it much. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of interracial marriages in the black ghetto. Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to your linguistic background for a second here. Uh, um, I'll read two sentences and you can explain the difference. Banks are less likely to give loans to black people. Black people are less likely to get loans from a bank. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I read that article too. Um, I don't hear the difference that much, but I can respect that the person supposes that if you put it as banks are less likely to give loans to black people, it'll make you think about what it is about the banks. Where I lose that person is that that person just assumes that the answer is that banks are racist in some way, that the person sitting behind the desk and assessing the person for a loan is partly affected by the fact that the person has brown skin. If mm -hmm. you look into issues like that, mm -hmm. but you have to look in, mm -hmm. and frankly, finance, banks, it's boring. No offense to anybody who's in that business, but the person who wrote that article thinks that. Frankly, I think that. I'm an armchair linguist. Mm -hmm. You're not going to look into the details probably, but it's not as simple as just skin color in those cases. And so that person is assuming that banks are racist. Banks are probably a teeny bit racist. Redlining. Banks in 2021, as opposed to 1914 or 1952, Mm -hmm. have all sorts of reasons for doing things where it would be hard to identify bigotry or discrimination mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. as the reason. I'm not sure that that person talking about language that way would be open to a discussion about that. But I mm-hmm. see where she's coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, I, looking through your bio, uh, some things that I found of interest, you went to Simon's Rock. I did. I went to Monument Mountain Regional High School in Great Barrington, also <laughs> the home of W.E.B. Du Bois, by the way. And you've been to the Mahewi. That's right. <laughs> yes, Theater. that's correct. <laughs> so so t- tell me about your education. You went to Simon's Rock. You, in the decisions that you made in your education, you 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 speak French. I mean, they're, 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 what are the why did you take this path to get where you are academically? You have the specialty in linguistics. Uh, t- tell me about what interested you in it and, and wh- why you made the choices you did. Um, I didn't make choices. I'm a, I'm a more feckless mm-hmm. person than most people would have reason to believe. I went to four mm-hmm. different schools. I went to Simon's Rock for two years. Most people only went there for two years back then. Had no mm-hmm. idea what I wanted to do. I got an AA in French only because I was good at it and I didn't know what else. Then I got a BA from Rutgers. I went to Rutgers for no reason at all. My parents <laughs> were not um, mm-hmm. not as connected to getting their kids into great schools as today's parents would be. Parents weren't as into that then. Mm-hmm. I certainly didn't care. I should have gone to Swarthmore, but they wouldn't take me. I could have gone to Haverford but we forgot to we forgot to hand in a financial aid form on time and they were strict about it. Rutgers mm-hmm. was the fallback. I wound up at Rutgers. I met some wonderful people at Rutgers who I still know, but I shouldn't have been there in general. It was it was two years on pause. I learned mm-hmm. a lot about ragtime while I was at Rutgers. And then I went to NYU because I wanted to live in New York City for a while. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to read more books. And so I got basically a night school degree in American studies, just a master's. I read Mm -hmm. some books. I got to read The Great Gatsby. I got to read, you know, I got to read (laughs) and see how now I don't even remember, but I got to read all sorts of great things with aging paperbacks I'm looking at right now. And Mm -hmm. then I spent a couple of years just kind of spinning my wheels. And Mm -hmm. I thought, I know the, the least feckless thing I did is that when I was in my very early 20s, I thought, I know I'm a professor. I can mm-hmm. feel that that's what I am, mm-hmm. but I don't know what of. And then I thought, well, I seem to have this facility with languages. And the only reason I knew that that meant linguistics was because I was working in a copy center at NYU to make ends meet. And people would bring in journals and things to be copied. And there was one person who was a linguist there who would bring in journals. That's the only reason I knew what linguistics was. And I thought, well, I guess maybe I can do that. That is really the story. And so I got a PhD in it because I could fake being good at it, which is really the best that I did while I was actually getting the degree. And Mm -hmm. none of this had anything to do with becoming a race commentator. You, You would have perplexed me if you had said to me in 1992 that Mm -hmm. you're probably going to be best known for saying contrary things about race that make people hate you. That is not what I was planning. (laughs) But I just, throughout the 90s, I thought things get better and better for Black people, despite Mm -hmm. Rodney King, despite this, that, and the other thing. And I found that the educated view was that things had not changed for Black people since 1960. And I didn't understand why. And there's a part of me, it's partly just being tidy. I couldn't rest with it. I couldn't say these people are crazy because they weren't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say these people were stupid because a lot of them were smarter than me. But I Mm -hmm. thought they are not processing reality. Why are they exaggerating? What is this? Mm -hmm. And that is what slowly led. I think it was particularly fueled by OJ. You know, it's at the point where we can say it was painfully clear that the man murdered two people. And Mm -hmm. yet for many, many years, Black people of all educational stripes were pretending not to see it. Mm -hmm. I just... didn't get it. And that's what led me to write Losing the Race in Mm -hmm. 2000. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it would become so widely read. I wrote it kind of as therapy. I happened to write quickly and I thought I'm going to put this out there so people will know what I think. And maybe some younger Black people will see that I'm not crazy, just like Shelby Steele taught me that I'm not crazy. And lo and behold, Losing the Race was a minor bestseller. Mm -hmm. And more lo and behold, I never stopped being asked to write editorials. I kept on thinking, well, I guess I'm having 15 minutes. Then it became a half hour. Mm -hmm. And then around 08, I thought, you know, people are not going to leave me alone. And so then I I settled into it. But for me, it really was just, I want to be a professor. 
I like languages. I thought I was going to write the book on Looney Tunes and not the minstrel ones, all of them. I've seen 850 of the 1,000. I love them to pieces. And somehow that didn't happen. And so here I am just, just dealing with how life actually came out. But it's all just been a crapshoot, really. But <laughs> I, I wouldn't have it any other way. At this it's a, I mean, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, I, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, and I'm curious, there like, it is. what is it is. It's a great book. It's a it's it's a fast read. I mean, there's there's no there's no sp space where it slows down. It, you just keep moving on. I, I recommend it to everyone. What's your next book? Well, I want to say, folks, just because there was a little normal crosstalk there. What I was okay. saying there was not. It is a great book. I said <laughs> there it is because I'm always so impressed to see it, the physical <laughs> object. I was saying there it is. I don't know uh -huh. if it's a great book. Um, uh -huh. You know, Deborah, I don't know what the next book is. And people are going to think I'm just saying this to seem cute or something. But I thought the next book is not going to be some angry screed. You know, it's mm -hmm. exhausting representing a book that never smiles. And so I thought I wanted to be something fun. Mm -hmm. And I actually thought, I mm -hmm. wonder if I could get it by my agent to mm -hmm. write the book on Looney Tunes from 1930 to last <laughs> week, because I think they are high art. Wouldn't uh -huh. you know that, God damn it, somebody just came out with a book about the Looney Tunes. And so now I can't, I can't do it. Somebody else wrote it. And so Jamie Weinman, damn you. And so now I have to write it about something else. And, you know, I, I don't know. I think the next book is going to be something about language. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> that's as far as I've gotten. I have no idea. Because to be honest, I did two in this mm -hmm. calendar year and my brain is fried. So I need mm -hmm. a break. So mm -hmm. my next book is going to be about, you know what it's going to be about? Not race. That's Not race. Maybe that'll be the title. Yeah. Maybe you can go against the Looney Tunes book that already came out. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you can have a different, a counter theory on it. My um, Looney Tunes. That's yeah, right. Yeah, really. Wrong on Looney Tunes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a thought. Um, I think I'm supposed to close this down now. If I'm wrong, uh, well, I guess there'll be some dead space afterward. Uh, anyway, unfortunately, that is all, all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for hosting it. And I really want to encourage everyone to purchase a copy of John Mc McWhorter's terrific new book, Woke Racism, wherever books are sold. Uh, and really, uh, you, can, you can read it in a weekend and feel smarter afterward. Uh, and I also want to encourage everyone to become a member of the Commonwealth Club. Visit the Commonwealth Club website at www.commonwealthclub.org and learn how to become a member. This program and others like it will be posted soon on the website. Ah, okay, my mouth is done. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. I'm Deborah J. Saunders and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you.